none of the enforcement agencies that were raiding these these marijuana gardens were do, had any idea and had any real vetted interest in the conservation side of it. That's just not what they're you know what they're sworn to do, and it's understandable. So all these grows are getting raided all over California and other states and the plants are getting ripped. Very few bad guys are getting caught because it's hard and challenging and very dangerous to develop the tactics to catch these guys because they're super savvy. They got field crap, they got camouflage, they're living out there four, five, six, seven months a year so they know every sound. They know when people are coming, they can smell you in the wind, they have bug out trails, they have booby traps. Um, very formidable poaching enemy, so to speak, the most formidable I've ever gone up against. And it kind of leads into why we had to develop a team of Met's nature that Hidmore goes into. This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is tomrollandpodcast.com and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on tomrollandpodcast.com and the social media is tom underscore Roland R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram or you can go to our big account, saltwater underscore experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now let's get on to today's show. This is retired fishing game Lieutenant John Norris, and you're listening to the Tom Rowland Podcast. John, what's going on? How are you? I'm great, Tom. How are you? Good to see you this morning. I'm fantastic. I really enjoyed uh, doing your podcast, and I'm really happy to have you on mine. Uh, you've had such an interesting life and career. It's uh, it's so cool what you have done. Yeah, it's it's been definitely a blessed journey, I must say. Um, I almost went the wrong direction as far as a career goes. I almost went into, I was dabbling with special forces in the military and in an engineering program, and then very serendipitously, Met a game warden in my first year of engineering school at San Jose State University, like 13 miles in the middle of nowhere in the backcountry of Henrico State Park on a college winter break and had a game warden check us thinking we were black-tailed deer poachers, you know, in the deep rut in a, in a protected park when we were just dumb college kids with all the wrong equipment soaked after a night of rain. And uh, when I found out he wasn't a park ranger and he was a game warden and what he actually did, because I'd never met a game warden yet, yeah, which... You know, it was really weird that you I've hunted and fished since I was nine years old and never met a game warden. Then I meet this guy going a totally different direction and I bend his ear and keep him there for two hours. And my eyes just got wider and wider and wider and more excited. And uh, my best brother outlaw buddy there and racing partner, Jeff, who was on that hike with me, goes, what's up with you, man? Something's changed. I said. I just found my calling. I need to make a major change when we get out of the woods. Wow. And it was, yeah, no kidding, brother. Six days later, we were out of that, that long, long um, uh, pack trip with a horse. It was amazing. And then I was back at San Jose State talking to the criminal justice advisor and wondering what I could do to go the fishing game route and switch up majors. And because San Jose State has an, uh, one of the best uh, criminal justice programs in the nation, like they had an engineering program, I was very fortunate to transfer over and not miss a miss a minute. Really? And uh, started going toward that degree and, you know, for undergrad and grad. And, you know, five years later, I finally made it. Uh, made the cut and started in 1992 and 30 years later, here we are. Huh. What was it that that particular game warden told you that, that changed the course of your life within a couple of hours? Well, you know, it's like, I kind of liken it to when you started fly fishing and became a guide 
And when you were out with clients or out fishing by yourself, you just felt, you felt complete, mm -hmm. you know, you felt yeah. elated. I mean, it was mother nature, your, you know, your physical fitness plays into all that um, morning, noon, night. I just felt invigorated. I felt like I, I had a lot of passion in the thought of what he was doing versus doing really well in engineering school. And I was going to join my, my uncle's civil engineering firm and be in the outdoors and do hydrology and dams and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm a hunter and fisherman. I don't want to be doing stuff that impacts, you know, wilderness areas. I want to be out enjoying them, conservation, protecting them. And he drives up in a four by four truck and comes mm -hmm. off this mountain and we're in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, who is this guy? He's by himself. He tells me what he does. He's unprotected. He's got his rifle. He's got a shotgun. He's got all his overnight gear. He's out there being a cop for wildlife and wildlands and waterways with no backup on the steel horse he rides. And I was just mesmerized by that because I've always been a backcountry kind of guy, you know, and spent a lot of time off the grid in those remote creeks to fish, remote hunting spots. Don't like the real big public areas. That's where I feel most invigorated. So long windedly, it was kind of that. I just knew right away. I went, wow. I, you know, I've wanted to do something in the service in the military type world. This is completely where I'm geared toward my wildlife background with dad and granddad, you know, raising me as a conservationist lifelong four generations. So I just, I just had that. I, I knew, you know, <laughs> it was just that soon. I just figured out what next, what do I do now? <laughs> you know, there's been a lot of work in the first phase. So it really worked out. And ironically, he was a county game warden, not a state game warden, one of the only two county game wardens in California. And I ended up getting to work with him many years later. Oh, really? When oh, I was a cool. pup game warden. I went from Southern California, three years in SoCal in the jungle, really had a high learning curve there because it was kind of crazy. And then got to transfer back to my home area and actually have that 105,000 acre amazing state park, Henry Co. as my patrol district. So I was working with him before he retired. So it was really, it was all Henry's fault. You know, I like to say, and Jeff's fault for taking me on that hiking trip, but it was, it was a great thing. Yeah. Did, I'm sure you had plenty of, of opportunity to tell him how meaningful he was to your life, I guess. But what, what how did he accept that? Kind of like, huh, did he even remember the interaction? You know, it was funny. I ended up calling him, um, not when I got the job, but I was down in Riverside County in the Temecula Lake Elsinore, just over the hill from Orange County for my first three years, 92 to 95. And, um, you know, down there, it was gangbangers from East LA coming into Riverside in my like river basins and mountain areas spotlighting for every animal, you know, oh. they'd kill anything that crawled, um, they gill net fish and they had AK 47s and all these assault weapons. And I'm, doing spotlighting stops on these guys by myself in my early twenties, like a year out of FTO Whoa. without backup and calling in like the Riverside County Sheriff. Sometimes they even sent their helicopter because as you know, game wardens don't always get a partner. We're very spread out. And I was down there really full of a lot of energy. I wanted to, you know, establish my career early. I wanted to get the bad, bad guys. Well, I went into overload with that and got into the deep end. Um, so that was three years. And when I finally got to come back home, I reached out. I didn't even have contact numbers for him. Mm -hmm. And then I, I reached out, I did some digging, you know, locally with the sheriff's department because he was attached to the sheriff's department. And then we had this lunch and he went, Oh my gosh, I remember you were those kids back in co park after that rainstorm. <laughs> and you had that fire and you were all freaking out thinking I was going to bust you as for an illegal fire. Cause I th <laughs> we thought he was a ranger, you know? Um, and then he was like, Oh, these guys need to dry their stuff out or they're going to like freeze. <laughs> 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 so yeah, we, uh, we hit it off at lunch. And after that, we were doing deer camp patrol together. We did uh, a lot of illegal baiting cases together. Um, I ended up coordinating with him and doing junior hunts and angling trips where we'd mentor kids and take them onto wildlife areas and fishing game own properties and do a pig hunt, a turkey hunt, a deer hunt, a bass fishing, you know, experience. And I did that for years with him, you know, uh, while he was still operational before he retired. And we had, we have had a great relationship ever since. So I'm very grateful. Wow. So that's an interesting area. Like the, what you just told me about the gangbangers coming in there and spotlighting, like what, what's going on there? Like they're just coming in there to try their weapons out and just shoot at anything that that's moving is, but that seems like a, that seems like a, uh, I mean, you kind of need a couple of rest of things to be in the recipe. You need like an urban area next to wildlife areas. So I can't imagine right. that there are a lot of other game wardens that are encountering situations like that, or maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. 
Is that you know, normal? It, it, it depends. I had a little bit of that. You know, I, I definitely had a percentage of that in the Silicon Valley where I'm born and raised yeah. and where basically I, you know, rode out the rest of my career, not only back as a game warden back at home after, you know, being in SoCal for three years, but, you know, it was 10 or 15 years doing that back in the Silicon Valley, promoting a Lieutenant, then getting the special operations tab and forming up the Met team that we're talking about in hidden war later, but that was all done basically in the Silicon Valley at home. Mm -hmm. Um, Riverside was a, was a weird beast, man. It was like, you were so close to the LA basin. It was only like an hour for them to shoot over the hill late at night without traffic. And the thing is, you know, you get, the criminal element going into those semi remote areas, very close to urban areas, because they just don't expect to have any drama from law enforcement, you know, and they're right. Unless you're going to run into a park ranger or a game warden or a forest service LEO. And, you know, we, as game wardens, we're not just with one forest, with one park, we're everywhere. Jurisdiction is federal and state. So I was in open space, you know, water company properties. I was on the national forest. I was back in, you know, Riverside County park areas, um, and there hadn't been a game warden in my position. The incumbent warden had transferred to like the Eastern Sierras like four or five years before I got there. So we call it a cherry patch mm. when a district that's been vacated by like a, you know, an, an iconic warden that has his reputation and everybody knows he or she leaves. They're like, oh, wow, we know how thin game wardens are. We know what this thin green line's like. We never see a game warden. And now there's one not even assigned to the area. So it became a haven for these guys to come over, let out a lot of steam get the machismo going, shoot the converted assault weapons, shoot at targets, shoot at animals, whatever. And, and then they would start encountering me and some of my partners and teaming up with Forest Service and realize that, hey, there's a presence in town now. We got to be a little more careful. And it took a solid year and a half before that stopped and real or was significantly reduced. I was, I mean, I remember in 1994, which was the last year I was down there before coming back home to the Northern California, myself and my squad mates, um, we had like just under a hundred spotlighting cases in a year's time, which is unheard of as a game warden doing spotlighting patrol. I mean, like 78 of those were mine alone, all from, you know, going out almost every night in my hot rural spots behind gates and along rivers and stuff and getting primarily these out of town opportunists and a lot of them being the, the criminal element that were just killing everything. And they were impacting what few deer we had predators, um, everything from small game and then throwing gill nets, you know, out all night while they're spotlighting one area and then going and picking up their gill net and, and just taking warm water fisheries and just decimating them and putting them all in the buckets to either take back to the LA basin to either consume or in a lot of cases actually sell. Hmm. you know, illegally. And it becomes a commercial wildlife sales. So it was like the, it was like the trifecta catching those guys because obviously the public threat danger, what they do in their, you know, day, daily job in the cities of say LA um, and then all the wildlife impacts. So I didn't quite know the magnitude of what we were getting in then I was brand new, but as I got further into my career and started to develop and work those more, you know, egregious environmental cases and wildlife cases, especially commercialization of wildlife, whether it be fish, Sturgeon row on the black market, abalone, uh, striper, you know, man, we, we see it all. And, uh, that's where you really make the dent is you get these illegal commercial guys that are just decimating one fishery, let's say, and they're selling it illegally all over the black market. And ironically, Tom, what very few people know is commercial wildlife, black market sales worldwide are second only to the drug trade. Hmm. And it's very close. I mean, we're talking wow. billions and billions of dollars, whether it's ivory, abalone, bear gall bladders, fish row, uh, deer meat, you know, um, you name it. It's it's going on all over the world and in our country. So um, that's something us game wardens have to tackle uh, daily, everywhere, regardless of what state we're, we're working out of. Wow. So that seems like you're, you're getting a lot of action as a young as a young game warden. And yeah. then later in your career you really figure out what action is like, that's, <laughs> that's kind of the good way, to, good way to freeze it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like seriously, when I read your book, which I have right here, the hidden war and uh, outstanding book, by the way, you've got, Thank you. um, it, it's entertaining to kind of see where you came from. You talk about your hunting and fishing background and, and you know, how your, your father and grandfather were, were so influential in your, in your life. And then, um, you know, how, how you became a game warden, but then, I don't know when you start reading this book, it's like, okay, well, when are we getting to the, to the, to the part about the cartels and stuff like that? But it just kind of materializes 
in through your career and how, how does that how does that necessarily happen i mean it's not just like all of a sudden somebody calls up and is like okay we've got this problem like this yeah. problem just kind of evolves and materializes from where you were just talking about and then how do you, how do you move to to creating this special operations team um which is what what it eventually turns out to be you know the hallmark of your career i get i mean i would think i don't, I don't know i don't want to speak for you but it seems like that yeah it was it was definitely the pinnacle and i think the most impactful for me personally and i think progressively it was a very important uh, definitely a very important development for the agency from the standpoint of impacting some of those more egregious wildlife criminals, meaning the drug cartels out of Mexico. And um, it, it wasn't in the game plan. Uh, one of these things that people always ask me, they're like, how did you go from traditional game warden? Like you just asked, and you're doing all the hunting, fishing, illegal poaching, that type of traditional stuff, hunter education instruction. And then next thing you know, you guys look like a domestic kind of SEAL team running around <laughs> out of helicopters with canines and you're a tiny little unit. You got snipers. That doesn't equate. It doesn't add up with game wardens. And, you know, on its surface, it does seem like out of place, but it was a long evolution. It kind of started in 2004 and 2005 when we, Nancy Foley was our chief at the time, and she assigned three of our officers to the, the camp program in California, which is Committee Against Marijuana Planting. It's a, a Department of Justice task force of multiple agencies. It's like three to five helicopter teams, and you're an allied agency team with each helicopter, and you're going all around California, which is obviously the weed state of the world, given our Mediterranean climate and the both the legal and illegal cannabis issues we still have today. And these officers will basically go into mostly public land, illegal grows in the forest, or there's national forests, state parks whatever, see these big cartel grows that are 5, 10, 15,000, maybe more plants, short haul into them under a helicopter, clear them out, make sure there's no bad guys in there. Mostly they would run away. And then we start chopping down all these illegal plants. Um, what we didn't know when we started doing that was how environmentally damaging and how much impacts these were having to waterways for fisheries, deer populations, small game, you know, other big game uh, species because of the banned poisons these guys import from across the border um, that you can't even use in this country, insecticides mm. like carbofuran that are so deadly that the EPA 20 years ago banned them from being used on our agriculture here in the US. That's how dangerous this stuff is. It's a nerve agent, it's an anticoagulant toxin, it's got all kinds of properties that actually were some of these uh, nerve agents that are actually in this poison, no exaggeration, Tom, were developed by the Nazis in their chemical weapons development wow. way back in World War II. Yeah. Now, this stuff is banned in the U.S., but it's still made in third world countries. It's still accessible because when you put this stuff on the plants, it kills everything. Um, if people touch it when the plants have been exposed or sprayed with this insecticide within 48 hours, it could be deadly to human ingestion, mm -hmm. animals, you know, nothing touches these plants. So we're going into these grow sites and after two or three days, this it kind of looks like a white opaque sheen over the cannabis plant and in the water below it. But in two or three days, it dries up invisible, but it's still on the plants. So all these years, we as game wardens with other agencies are going in to raid these grows. And we have no idea what's on these plants and how deadly they are. But we're seeing rabbits dead, you know, like with right at the water base of the plant where they take a little sip. Gray fox, mountain lions. I I have this in the you know some of the pictures in the book you've got in Hidden War and ones I show in PowerPoints all over the country show a 400 pound black bear sow dead at the bottom of a tree who sipped up just a, a couple drops of this stuff in a tuna can that the growers put out to kind of suck the animals in to poison them before they get to the plants. So this this uh, big sow dies and then her baby cub, who's about 50 pounds, crawls up in the little the tree that she's next to and is in a V of the tree on two branches and dies as well from exposure. Wow. And I show that because I look at conservation as you and I are as anglers, as hunters, responsible use of our resources and, you know, for the thriving of all wildlife species. And then even preservationists, my animal rights groups, when I show pictures to that, of that to both sides of the spectrum, everybody is united. They're like, that is BS. That's no way wildlife should be dead. The poison carcass, the meat doesn't get used. It's not part of the natural predation cycle if it hasn't been harvested under conservation or those fish that are now floating. I mean, I've had steelhead trout fisheries, brother, no joke, 
with some of this carboferrin that leaches into the creek where they're sucking the water for their plants from. And I lose two miles of steelhead spawning for two, three years. Wow. And that was the first grow I actually found with a biologist friend of mine that was doing a steelhead fisheries and frog study that, that I grew up with in that same area, Henry Co Park, not far from where I met that game warden. And it's covered in the first book, War in the Woods, which is this one hmm. that I wrote 11 years ago, but Hidden War does reference that. Yeah, I read and that. Basically- I read that about that. And they diverted that stream. They diverted it and they destroyed it. And so none of the enforcement agencies that were raiding these, these marijuana gardens were do had any idea and had any real vetted interest in the conservation side of it. That's just not what they're, you know, what they're sworn to do. And it's understandable. So all these grows are getting raided all over California and other States and the plants are getting ripped. Very few bad guys are getting caught because it's hard and challenging and very dangerous to develop the tactics to catch these guys because they're super savvy. They got field crap. They got camouflage. They're living out there four, five, six, seven months a year. So they know every sound. They know when people are coming. They can smell you in the wind. They have bug out trails. They have booby traps. Um, very formidable poaching enemy, so to speak, the most formidable I've ever gone up against. And it kind of leads into why we had to develop a team of Met's nature that hidden war goes into because of just how dangerous this stuff was. So the environmental impacts. And then in 2005, August 5th, 2005, a day that will be carved in my, my, you know, memory and soul forever was the day we got in our first officer involved shooting. And it was myself and two of the game wardens uh, that were working with me, three sheriff's deputies, one unarmed park ranger in an area called mid peninsula open space, just above the foothills of Los Gatos, one of the affluent little foothill cities above the Silicon Valley, above the tech capital. And um, we went into a grow that day, always looking for bodies. So I was, you know, the sheriff's borrowed me because we had done good work before on the previous uh, operations. And um, they really liked working with us game wardens because we knew how to move in the woods. We were quiet, you know, everybody was in shape. There was no whining. There was no, um, you know, I'm tired after 10 hours. It's going to be a 16 hour day. We were building those relationships with, sheriffs, with police, with DEA, with Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, and starting to make that tactical integration that would later lead to MET. But on that particular day, um, we were ambushed. A grower got one shot off with an AK-47 derivative, like an SKS rifle, shot my young warden partner through both legs. So he, one round, steel core, you know, military round, did what it was supposed to do, went through his left leg, exited, and then tumbled through his right leg. Mm. So he was bleeding out of four holes for almost three hours before we could get him an air rescue. Wow. And I'm treating him for shock. I'm trying to keep the bleeding down by the good graces. It didn't hit the femoral or any arteries where we were able to slow bleeding down enough where he, he survived barely, albeit, and we got him airlifted out of there. But when that incident happened, um, I knew in the back of my mind, one, this is one of the most damaging environmental criminals we have. And they're definitely a public safety aggressive mess to our public, not only in California, but they're embedded nationally. And I, in my, you know, in my mind, I knew this needed to be a priority for our agency and something that was going to add to the numerous challenges game wardens already have of doing the traditional patrol, the commercial wildlife sales, the undercover, the black market, the Marine patrol. I mean, we do a lot of work. You you know, it being an angler Mm -hmm. and you're out there as part of that thin green line supporting our efforts. And it's just, it's a, it's a daunting task, but a, but a beautiful one, you know, um, but we were a long way from having our own team. We continue to work with the sheriff's department, um, members that I would later recruit onto the marijuana enforcement team, like Brian Boyd and canine Phoebe that were working up in Shasta County. Well, he was becoming the go-to guy with the best dog we we've seen nationally in Shasta County. While I'm down in Santa Clara County, Silicon Valley, working with my guys and other guys in the Fresno basin, every certain game wardens that had tactical experience were just gravitating toward work in these type of operations. So we had all the skill sets. We just didn't have the formal team. Um, we had four more gunfights before Met was built, where we didn't have dogs on missions. We were doing physical apprehensions and running guys down. Um, They weren't giving up. They were pulling big guns on us. We were having to engage uh, to go home. And next thing we know, it's, you know, gunfight after gunfight after gunfight. And our administration are still keeping us in it, but everyone's kind of holding their breath like, all right, man. um, mm, uh, Yeah, that that marijuana work is cool, but you might want to get back to the traditional stuff. This is getting a little too hairy. And then finally, I got the green light to build a test program, a pilot program in the summer of 2013 
Mike Carrion was the chief at the time. He was one of my mentors from the academy, uh, was my waterfowl ID expert guy that trained us on that defensive tactics. I later, he later developed me into being a tactical instructor in firearms, defensive tactics, ground fighting, all that stuff, um, and really believed in me. So I had that. And if it hadn't been for a leader like Mike and Nancy before him, you would have never saw this team develop because it was very unconventional. It's certainly a lot of traditionalists didn't want to see game wardens being a special ops team doing this. Um, obviously the guys on this team are some of the best game wardens in the state. Everybody had exemplary careers. I truly consider them the one percenters of the agency, um, given the tasks that we were doing. And when we all went in to start that pilot program, uh, we pulled people from districts where they were, they were, you know, incumbents. I mean, they were institutionally knowledged. All were, we were all field training officers, you know, we were training the new folks in the Academy. So it was going to take a hit. So obviously we had patrol administrators a little like, what are you doing? You're taking Brian, you're leaving, you're taking two guys with you. You're a Lieutenant of my squad. I'm going to lose three people. So, you know, empathetically, it was a huge hit, but what we, we needed to do it. It was becoming one of the biggest, if not the biggest environmental crime threats in California. And that pilot program in 2013 that the book starts out in kind of templated what we became. And then the first six years of ops, Tom, or like, you know, from reading the book, they were crazy, man. I mean, it was five, six missions a week. And um, we, uh, because of the advanced training and having snipers and having two dedicated canines now to every mission we would engage on, those dogs saved so many lives and kept us out of more gunfights, not only on our side, but also on the grower side. Mm -hmm. I mean, a guy getting bit by one of our canines, like Phoebe or the other, I can't mention by name, that are still operational. Yeah, they're going to be tore up a little bit. They're going to hurt. They're going to have a leg bite or an arm bite, but they're going to be alive. And they're not going to get to the gun that they're trying to get to in their waistband or the assault rifle. And we're not going to have to engage. And that's a win-win. Anytime we don't have to go to guns, that, that we always prefer that, obviously. Um, but we ended up having one last one in 2017 that was uh, pretty hairy, but we came out on top, had three dogs on that mission. It was literally the same Sierra Azul property where my partner had gotten shot in 05. And here's the irony of it, like 12, 13 years later, we're on that same property, but on the other coastal county side where there is no enforcement for this outdoor trespass cartel stuff. Mm -hmm. So the cartels are embedded and grow over there five, six years, run in the forest, heavily armed, very aggressive, fighting us on every mission. And we come out of that one because our dog engaged and our, and our handler, uh, Brian, was able to engage the suspect before he could get a shot off. And wow. uh, everybody survived. And um, everybody survived, uh, you know, successfully, in, including the bad guys we were dealing with that day. Um, and it was just a testament to having the right people, having the right training, having the right support and making a dedicated effort. You know, I mean, if we're going to go into an area of enforcement, we got to go all in or stay out. Right. Right. Um, you're an all in kind of guy in your work and what you the great work you do for conservation and, and outreach. Um, and I'm wired the same way. I mean, I'm giving me I'm, I'm, we're 110 percent or let's not even waste our time. Someone's going to get hurt. And I don't and I just feel horrible if we have a half ass attempt and we look uh, unprofessional out there and met didn't only do a lot of good things and continues to do a lot of good things for our environment and our wildlife resources, but it legitimized and professionalized what game wardens can do if they're given the support and they have the right people. And I'm really proud of what the guys have done. And they're still doing it every day. As we speak now in the heat of California right now, they are on a mission somewhere in a cartel raid, walking into potential punji pits and snares and armed bad guys looking for them with our dogs on high alert. And they're doing good work right now, guaranteed. And I'm proud of them. Wow. That's incredible. So a couple of questions. Um, obviously the cartels moving up, people are aware that that's happening. Law enforcement agencies are aware that that's happening. So is it because they're wildlife um, violations as a part of this, that that's why it falls into the game warden and, yes. And but does that allow the game wardens to go in where other law enforcement agencies might not have been? Or why is it that I mean, it seems like you got you got SWAT, you got DEA, you've got all these other agencies. I'm just trying to um, understand why it made sense for this to to yeah. fall into the hands of the of the game wardens, which now this is going to be like a, a new program, new training, new everything. Like what's the connection there to the to the game warden 
as opposed yeah, to DEA a, that's a, that's a, or CIA yeah, or I don't know yeah, whatever yeah. other three three letter letter agency we <laughs> whatever might have. acronym yeah. yeah federal state local some, right yeah, galactic jurisdiction um that's a great question man and no one's ever really asked it that way but but basically it was because of the environmental damage we are sworn you know to protect wildlife waterways and wild lands and a lot of that comes into waterways. Um, and us both as anglers, how precious waterways are to us. And, you know, I, I now live on the Kootenai River here in northwestern Montana, one of the, I think, the last quasi pristine rivers we have left. And I'm always alerted to, man, I don't ever want that threat here because I've seen mm-hmm. what it did to beautiful waterways in California, you know, that fortunately we were able to get back. But basically, the waterway damage to this stuff with those poisons. And how much just a couple tablespoons of that carbofuran can decimate a one, two, three mile creek and kill every aquatic in, within it, every unborn steelhead, uh, every frog, and then not to mention what's drinking out of it. Um, that's why we're involved. And once, uh, once DEA and once, you know, basically the drug czars under the cabinet, uh, you know, under the president, and this was during the Obama administration, realized that there was so much environmental damage connected to these cartels on these illegal cannabis grows. They started to see what we were kind of preaching as the, the, the solution of make this an environmental crime issue. Don't make it a drug issue because cannabis, whether you're for it, against it, legal or illegal, Good, bad, left, right. The bottom line is it's not about cannabis. It's about what a black market is inciting to destroy our wildlife, waterways and and wild lands. And when our biologists and our experts in our agency, mostly us game wards on the ground, started to see that, you know, I can go write 100 fishing without license tickets and maybe catch 20 guys taking an over limit of trout or undersized bass. But one cartel grow I take out and take the risk as dangerous as it is, I just saved a whole steelhead migration for a year that's maybe 300 fish coming in from the Pacific Ocean, and they're federally threatened and endangered. And every one of these fish is valued almost $35,000 by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the gov- at the federal level. I can protect that whole stream, which is the black-tailed deer. It's the small game. It's the, you know, it's everything that's feeding off this deal. So... That's why we got involved. And ironically, in California, being such a diverse state with so many resources and cannabis now being regulated, we our game wardens now almost it's up to almost a quarter. We have over 100 officers out of 500 dedicated to the cannabis enforcement program team. They're not not only a handful of them are on the special ops met team, the you know kind of the tactical unit I formed up, but there's all these private land teams. Because now you've got private land cannabis that even though it's in plain view, there's still a lot of tons of illegal cannabis. They're using a ton of banned poisons in these hoop houses and these little outdoor, you know, private land grows. And they're stealing water from other creeks and they're polluting into creeks. So it's just an environmental train wreck on cannabis enforcement all over the Golden State. And that's why we're involved long windedly. It's just it's a one of the biggest environmental crimes going on anywhere. So it made sense really for game wardens, not only to be involved, but to really specialize in the environmental component of it and go after environmental crimes and rectify and reclimate grows. One of the things I talk about in hidden war, um, when we develop the team, we have a three pronged approach to basically every mission. And I call it the triangle, right? First prong of the triangle is aggressive apprehension and, and tactical apprehension of these guys, get them caught, get them out of circulation, you know, whether they're deported or not, depending on politics, whether they see jail time, just take them out of circulation, put some deterrence on them because they're going to do damage in another grow tomorrow. If you don't catch them and you rip the plant, the grow you're in second phase is destroy these plants, make sure they don't make it into the black market because right, wrong, or indifferent on cannabis regulation. Nobody wants to see a poisoned cannabis plant go into the black market for Midwesterners and Eastern seaboarders where most of this stuff goes for these kids experimenting with toxically tainted weed that has carbofuran. It has nerve agents on it, right? We don't want to see that get into the market at all. And that's what we got to stop. And then the third and kind of the dirty job, quote unquote, is cleaning up those growth sites doing reclamation where you spool up all the water line, you take out the Creek diversion, you restore the Creek, you take out the fertilizer bags, the 
trash that's been going on for seven months from four guys living out there, you know, that's a, that's a, a daunting task and very tiring and very exhausting and very dirty. But we always try to do the day of the mission with secondary teams or more people coming in when the area is safe to do so do a reclamation restoration of the site. And nobody was doing that before mm. fish and wildlife got involved and forest service got involved. And now we've built such good bridges with legitimacy, with the tactical SWAT units of the cities, the sheriff's department, um, DEA, where they're looking to us and going, Hey man, Matt, go lead the mission. you got a reclamation plan. We'll bring guys to help out. We'll bring our SWAT team. If you need a perimeter team or help you guys on the tactical uh, apprehension element and it's just been a great merger of a force multiplier. You wow. know, allied agency yeah. relations, uh, honestly, have never been better. Um, we saw this through COVID, brother, when the world went upside down in chaos. And since the cartels thrive in a world of chaos, when we had this global pandemic, they went, oh, woohoo, hmm. yeah. Disneyland, man, I got the golden ticket. I'm riding the rides all day long. And they did that. And on top of that, with all the civil unrest and the riots and the, the medical issues and the shutdowns, our forest got decimated and it was national. And while you were, your podcast was going and, you know, Wayne, my co-host and I went with you and doing a great episode of thin green line recently, we actually started the thin green line podcast about a month after lockdown to fill in the gaps of not just telling game warden stories on warden's watch. And part of this was what is this doing to these criminal elements that are embedded right now? I mean, because we got to remember these cartels were fighting on the illegal cannabis front on the game or an environmental crime issue. They're in, they're doing human trafficking. They're doing child sex trafficking in every state. Synthetic fentanyl production that's killing tens, if not more thousands of young people all over the country. Uh, the counterfeit prescription opioids we're finding out from DEA from these dirty labs that, you know, a kid blows out an AC, ACL plant in football in high school, say in the Silicon Valley gets a prescription painkiller. It comes from a dirty lab in the black market and he dies that night in his bed from a prescription. Like it, yeah, how does that stuff in, end up in, in like a legitimate pharmacy? Well, this is the thing. It's not the legitimate pharmacy action. It's these kids are getting these painkillers, you know, from these affluent communities from friends oh. that are saying, oh, yeah, this is, you know, this is my parents' uh, prescription. Right. So you're saying they run out of their prescription. They're looking for more. They get it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I got yeah. you. Or, or they just ask and they find it because these things, Tom, these, these pills are literally marketed and they're packaged just like a legitimate pharmaceutical that comes from a legitimate company right out of Mexico. And wow. they're in these dirty labs and like, and some of you know, some of the pills are fine. And then like every third pill, you're probably not going to survive. And wow. that's what, that and that's another scary. element. It, very scary. And the fact that through COVID and depression issues and everybody through lockdown, we saw, you know, alcohol consumption, drug consumption, all of this was going up. And, and, and then people started getting outdoors, we noticed, and we're getting a kind of some life of hiking on trails and maybe going fishing for the first time, buying hunting licenses, like mm -hmm. in ridiculous amounts, which was an upswing. But we did see a whole lot of uh, bad stuff from what the cartels are doing, especially in the drug, the cannabis front as well. You know what I don't understand is the, and, and I'm probably super naive because I'm, I'm old, um, but <laughs> <You and me both. laughs> I don't understand the fentanyl. Like, hmm. I don't, I don't understand. Like I, at first I thought, okay, well, you know, coming from like when, when, when I first got to Key West, it was the drug, the drug deal was going on, man. I saw, I saw airplanes flying, dropping things out of the airplanes, fast boats going over there to pick them up. I don't know what they're picking up, but uh, apparently it was, the cocaine was a really big thing, right? Oh, yeah. So you get a, a kilo of really good cocaine, then you could cut it with something else. And now you have two kilos of really good cocaine, I guess. So now you have, or maybe four or five, you triple or quadruple your yeah. your um your your original source okay i get that 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 i understand that that's like from a business perspective okay you you paid for this now you have four times this much people won't really right. notice the difference and i was thinking that fentanyl was was that like nothing but but a cutting agent something that you put in there to expand the original source but i don't know if that's true or not because like yeah. what, what, what is it? Why, why is fentanyl even 
even a thing? Is it, is it something that you, that you, yeah. I don't understand it. Is it, does it get you high it's your, itself? And then they're putting it in for an expanded effect of, of, of whatever drug they're, they're putting it in or what's your opinion on that? Well, fentanyl is a synthetic. It's completely its own product. And this is what's so scary about it, brother, is fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, basically synthetic heroin that's thousands of times more powerful in the same dose as an actual heroin done from a cocoa, you know, mm-hmm. from, from opium poppies, just like cocaine. So cocaine is a pure product from a cocoa leaf, right? As we know. And yeah, it has all kinds of negative effects. We all know that. But when it's, unless it's cut with poisons, you're probably not going to die from taking this Coke, at least for a long time. Fentanyl, man, one dose of it, that's just a micro dose too much because it was measured on the, you know, it was done in the black market. It was done in these cartel labs. Um, one normal dose for someone that's using heroin, they're now using fentanyl because they don't need to use much. They can get it cheap. It's all over the streets, just like this black market tainted cannabis is from these uh, cartels and one dose and they're dead in minutes Um, just because it's so much more potent to shut your system down as a depressant, just like that. And so this stuff is it's apples and oranges compared to heroin itself, Um, but it is becoming kids are using it. Kids can get it cheap. Um, it's, it's marketed everywhere. Now we're seeing it on the West coast, uh, it kind of seemed like a Midwest East coast thing at first, a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And then through COVID, we saw it kind of migrate out to my old stomping grounds of the West coast. And it's now up here in the Northwest. It's just really, really nasty stuff. Um, it's made obviously in some far, you know, pharmacies and so a legitimate pharmaceutical when done very carefully for pain killing, you know, sure. for actual medical procedures, but it's all this black market fentanyl. That's just a nightmare. Yeah, I, and guess it's, I didn't uh, realize that it was, that it was a synthetic heroin or designed to be a yeah. synthetic heroin. Cause Sadly like, is, even yeah. when you look at a, 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 a show like Ozark, like that's what, right. that's what she yeah. puts in. She puts fentanyl like just, and not even that much. Like she just puts it right in there, stirs it in and then everybody dies. Yeah. And you're just like, whoa, what is fentanyl? And why would you even want that? If that would kill you like that, why would you even want to mess with that? But look, I don't know, man. It's that's, that's why I say I'm naive. I don't, I don't know. Those are like, I, I understand the the drugs that were, were, you know, popular when I was a young person and they're around and you hear about them and you're, you're, you're just kind of aware of things. But these days, I don't even know. And as a parent, I felt like I really needed to know and, you know, to, to talk to my kids. And I try to talk to my kids a lot more about drugs than, than, um, than my parents ever did. But one of the things that I told them is like, don't nothing, you know, nothing synthetic. Like you have no idea where that came from. No idea what it is. Like if it's a pill, a powder, you have no idea what that is. None whatsoever. You could just touch it and it would kill you. And, um, you know, luckily, luckily that was good advice. I guess. I don't know. My, my kids didn't seem to run into it too much, or at least they didn't tell me about when they ran into things like that. But I, I know that I put that in their head of just, you, you, some guy could be mixing drain cleaner and some other stuff in their, right. in their garage. Yeah. And, you know, would you go and eat a sandwich if you had just, had drain cleaner all over your hand. No, you'd wash your hands. Well, now you're taking like, it's just imagine that. Like, and, and I think I did put it in their mind. Like, don't know what that is. And, uh, we, unfortunately we've seen some kids, you know, get a hold of even synthetic marijuana and it, it messed them up real, real bad because apparently it was not synthetic marijuana. It looked like it, it was sold to them as it, but it was it fentanyl. I don't know something. Yeah. And, and kids got messed up. Yeah. And that's, man, amen to that. We, we got to educate our kids on this stuff because what they're seeing, the potency, uh, the lack of organic nature of it, this isn't a cannabis plant grown in a, in a DEM certified organic cannabis farm, say in Northern California, mm-hmm. this stuff's nasty, man. You hit it on the head and um, the synthetic on the cannabis side and the THC level and the stuff they're mixing on this. And, you know, you mentioned Ozark, great show. <laughs> yeah. I, I followed it right to the end and that final you know finale that ended this year on season four, but they actually hit that on the head. It was very accurate. It was very proximate and timely for what we're seeing on the fentanyl trade of, you know, Hey, we'll just throw fentanyl 
fentanyl in it. We can sort of cut it, sort of not. It's very little investment on us and instant death. And that's the problem. And our kids are running across that. You know, yeah. we had a kid, um, a friend of a friend, and I uh, just confirmed this about a month ago in the Silicon Valley, going to a really good high school, um, had an injury in, in sports and got one of these fentanyl, bad, dirty uh, prescription, quasi prescription opioids, took the pill and parents found that child dead the next day oh in their in their bed before going to school. This was an A student set to go to a great college, um, you know, had a, had a, a sports scholarship, the whole nine. And that's kind of shaken up my old stomping grounds to find out, Hey, where did it come from? Where's the source? I mean, if it can happen, you know, in the affluent Silicon Valley, we know it's getting to everybody. Right. And so we have to educate our kids. And I'm glad you mentioned that with your, your kids, especially and my nieces, nephews, and everybody, all the kids I work with, I'm just like, Hey man, I'm not going to be big brother and say, don't try drugs. Just say, no, you're going to do what you do as a teenager, but ha- here's some education, right? There's let some me show you PowerPoint. Types. Yeah. Let me show you a couple pictures <laughs> from one of my presentations on what this poison does to wildlife that you might ingest on black market cannabis and now fentanyl. Um, and I've had a lot of kids just go, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing that. Mm. I'm just, I'm just done. I, I used to smoke weed at parties, but you're right. I don't know where it came from and it could have this crap on it. And that's what it did to a fraud, a mountain lion that, you know, ingested two drops, you know? So it's, it's something they got to know, man. I'm glad you bring that up. Yeah. So John, tell me about, um, you know, since you started, since you started this, this book and you started the, the Met, um, you know, there've been a lot of changes with, with legal marijuana. Yes. You just mentioned it. How does, how does that change things? Like, especially like, first of all, are the legal marijuana places, are they growing in a way that is sustainable to wildlife that, I mean, I'm sure that they have to, you know, just like growing corn or growing soybeans or growing exactly. whatever they have to abide by whatever, but I don't want to speak for you. I want you to tell me what, what's going on there. But then also, how does that affect the, the cartel? Does this become, do they become more aggressive? Do they move to different areas? What's going on there when, when the legal happens? Yeah, that's, there's a lot to that question. I'll start with just, uh, you know, regulation and what's changed. And in California, being kind of the weed state of the world, being one of six Mediterranean climates, we can grow from February almost to Christmas outdoors in some parts of the state and then indoors. We're like the, like fine wine out of the Napa Valley, right? That's what California is known <laughs> yeah. for. Even we Justin Bieber good. says so. Right. <laughs> 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 there it is. Old Justin. Yeah. Um, bottom line is in, in 2016, We regulated under Proposition 64. We made recreational cannabis legal in California. We tightened up the medicinal laws on medical marijuana. And everyone was telling us in in the agency, like, oh, man, you got this high speed, low drag tactical unit. You guys are going to be out of a job. You ready to go back to patrol? And I just looked at him and laughed. I said, this isn't going to change a thing. I said, mark my words. And I'll say two years. And I mentioned in the last chapter hidden where I talk about an overview, regulations moving forward and the challenges of cannabis regulation not only California, but nationally, what do we got to look at? And now we're five years. This year literally marks the five year anniversary, if you will, of regulating in California and no pun intended. It is a train wreck in California right now. Hmm. The black market has increased. The cartels are still doing the outdoor trespass stuff, although a little less because now they can go into private land. They can integrate in with another farmer buy a piece of land. They can integrate under someone's recommendation that has maybe one license to grow and they can kind of blow it out. They're still using the man toxics. They're just doing it in a private land, more overt place. And it's just blown up 100 fold or or more. Um, Now what we're doing is, and you know, we've got the call sign trailblazer documentary going that's chronicling all of these trends plus the personal and professional career career history that I was involved in. But I'm also helping on another Daily Caller documentary with Jorge Ventura's group. And we were just in Siskiyou County, Northern California for a week last month. I was co-hosting with him and going on raids with my old partners from Siskiyou County sheriffs. And here we are in the regulated state of California. And we got the most rural, remote, mountainous county that has Mount Shasta right in it with that super tall peak of fresh glacier water, Mm -hmm. right? And all that ice and the Oregon border and 15 plus thousand 
cartel, and this, this is Asian cartels, not the Mexican cartels necessarily, but the Mongs and Chinese out of the Midwest that have come in and organized crime groups, bought up all this property, put up these hoop houses, spray all this nasty stuff on the cannabis, and are shipping it daily, 24 hours a day back east onto the black market. And there is so they are so inundated and there's so little law enforcement pressure to even put a dent in less than two or 3% of it, that they're just taking over the County. No exaggeration. And when this thing airs, it'll blow people's minds of what we saw on these raids, what we saw interviewing these farmers, these ranchers, these single mothers living in these rural communities with these cartel gangsters taking these towns over, Tom, no exaggeration, with body armor, driving up with AK-47s and meeting a rancher at their gate and going, you're probably not going to have a lot of water soon, but don't make an issue of it and your family will stay safe. And then they drive away. They're using so much water underground with illegal wells, with uh, water trucking and siphoning water from creeks or taking water supplies from cities in the middle of the night that ranchers can't feed their cattle right now. Wow. Farmers can't grow alfalfa. And while California is under a massive state drought water restriction, because we're in our second largest drought in like a century, these, these illegal cannabis growers are running with impunity. And the sad part is the legitimate cannabis industry, the people that have regulated, done it right, paid all the money for the permits, have it uh, DEM certified, and inspected, completely organic, seed all the way to sale point. Um, and that's only about 20% of all of the cannabis grown and sold in California. Maybe 20% of it is legal. 80% of it is still black market. And these legal growers, unless they're a multi-million dollar operation that's barely breaking even, they're going under. Hmm. They can't continue to do it. They're getting out of the business or they're going to go back to the black market and sell out of state because they can't make a living with the oversight, especially with what the black market is, is out competing the legal product because the black market has been incentivized. So it's not that we regulated in California, it's how we regulated. Mm. When we regulated and made this stuff legal, you know, and what a 30% of the, my role as a Lieutenant of the Met team was outreach and education. So I did presentations for every year I ran the team for six years, but right before we were about to regulate in, in 2016, when prop 64 came on board as a concept, I went, I probably did 200 presentations and PowerPoint spiels all over the state. Grower groups coming out of the dark to, you know, see what this was going to be, what it would take for them to regulate, to get legal, which we really encouraged. Legislative groups, lobbyists, the governor's aides, everybody. And I said, guys, we know it's coming. We know it's good. we're going to have regulation. If you regulate, please regulate appropriately. Um, reward the legitimate grower doing it by the numbers. But if you've got a cartel in a park, Make sure that felony statute as it sits now holds. Make sure you have these aggressive penalties for any illegality, especially in environmental crime. They did just the opposite to get it to pass. Mm -hmm. They watered the felony to a misdemeanor and for a juvenile offender in the outdoor trespass grow an infraction. So the cartels go, it's a misdemeanor to grow in the national forest. Mm -hmm. And all these agencies now are not going to enforce any of this cannabis stuff because they've regulated in California. Disneyland, one more time, I'm riding every ride for free. So the cartels blew up. Other states have started to regulate and they've done it sort of like we did in California poorly. So they're starting to blow up with the black market. So it's something that I'm addressing and working on nationally now to say, look, guys, if we're going to regulate, we got to regulate correctly. And if we're going to regulate, we got to look at federal regulation like tobacco like what alcohol, tobacco, and firearms do, how the wine industry is regulated with organic standards and purity and testing. It's got to be done the same way. And, and it's going to have to be done universally to stop these black market incentives of these guys in our forests. And I'm looking at this strictly as not a cannabis issue, but as an environmental crime, public mm -hmm. safety issue of these kids ingesting this tainted weed and then these steelhead fish, not ever going to make a spawn because this crap went into the creek. Right. So, can it be done? I mean, from your perspective, like what you're, what you're talking about, like, uh, it seems, it seems, that seems like a lot to be, be done. I mean, like with well, the way yeah. you describe it, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, but can it, can it be done? Are we so far down the road that, that that's a possibility or does it, does, does it look like, you know, small steps over 10 years and you could maybe get there? Like, what does it look like to you? 
Yeah, I'm a I'm a hopeless optimist, man. I always, you know, I go for the little win and I consider it a victory because we got to stay in the fight. Um, I don't think it's something that's going to happen overnight. I, I know right now the current administration is looking at, you know, federally descheduling cannabis and allowing fe- federal regulation to come in. Again, that could work if it's done right. But if you start getting politics and and money involved, then everything suffers. Public safety communities erode and wildlife gets destroyed. And that's what we saw in California. We had a vetted interest of those people pushing cannabis regulation that were going to gain a lot from it or already had gained a lot from it. And I'm afraid that the other states will, it's just the nature of politics when these laws get through that process. And that's very uh, discouraging, but the overall message is if we did it like tobacco, and got to that point, would we still have a black market? Sure, because we still have a tobacco black market, but you don't hear about the gunfights with the cartels over tobacco leaves, you know, fighting for, you know, Philip Morris and big tobacco. You're just not seeing that. So I think it can be done. I think it will take time and it will take a concerted effort to consider this a national priority, uh, almost an emergency situation um, like a wildfire campaign that breaks out and we send a lot of attention to it to solve the problem for public safety. We named the second book, Tom Hidden War by design, because I've been dealing with this now for 15 plus years. There's been two books on it. There's been two nationally recognized documentaries, Patriot Profiles, Life of Duty we did on the team and on us before we were on the team, investigative news stories, my TV stuff. And I still get people when they hear about it for the first time going, Lieutenant, I had no idea there were cartels in America doing this and that, that they destroy fish. I fish every day, you know, and my kids and the, this toxically tainted weed, what is going on? And I said, hit more, man. It's been under our noses. It just doesn't get the attention it needs. And granted, we have a lot of things to deal with in this crazy world right now. The geopolitical climate of the crap mm-hmm. going on internationally, COVID, you name it, lockdowns, divisiveness, civil unrest. But I look at it as, we're always going to get a victory and rather policies change quickly or slowly, brother. I look at what my Met brothers are doing today as we speak. And even though it's an uphill battle and they're like trying to hold back a tidal wave and they're not going to hold it back, they're going to take out one grow out of a hundred plus thousand that are doing egregious environmental damage as we speak. But that one they take out might save some fish. It's definitely going to keep somebody from stumbling in there and getting hurt like you or me going mm-hmm. trying to hike into a pristine creek to catch a trout. And now we're in a punji pit and we're seeing plants and we see a guy with an AK-47. That won't happen in today's grow that they're on. So I, I always re- remind them, you know, and I talk to him all the time. I consult and train a lot of teams in California and other parts of the country doing the same type of stuff. Um, with the, with the threat emerging now in their states. And what I tell these guys is said, look, man, little victories, every mission you do is making a dent. And I know it feels thankless. <laughs> and in my old political state of California, I feel for the boys, but Hey man, they're doing a good job and we got to just look at it that way and hope for the best. And um, I think we can make a change, but we're going to have to harness a lot more attention mm-hmm. to this thing as a priority nationally. Wow. You know, um, maybe I'm, Super naive again, but you mentioned that there is a, a tobacco black market. Is it really? Like, yeah, I, I hear about it. I don't work it directly, but I hear so the. I mean, you get black, well, you get like black market uh, Cuban cigars coming in. I know that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just very, very. I mean, it's so minimal. We don't even really hear about it. Right, but reminded. but at one point it wasn't that way, and at one point the alcohol black market wasn't go. that way. And it yep. was, it was huge. And I'm sure yep. that there was some point where people are like, well, you know, it, it's, it's a tidal wave that you're never going to stop. Like there's always going to be people with stills in the woods, but until it becomes like what, what ends up having to happen with the, with the alcohol, is it that it just becomes so available and so cheap and so legal that it's not worth the risk? Like you might as well exactly do something else. Like, Yep. Right. I mean, I guess and, and that's, that's what it has to happen with, with the with the marijuana too. What are, what are the chances um, that like if eighty percent are are illegal grows and you're saying that they're 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 shipping all that to the East Coast? What are the chances that that ends up in a legal dispensary? Some of it, that it can stuff. Still end, it it does still end up in legal dispensaries. We see it. Um, there is obviously some holes in the process. Uh, and we know that some of this black market cannabis is getting into dispensaries. I mean, we know 
that some of this cartel cannabis is getting into dispensaries. I don't think a lot of it, thankfully, but we know it's getting in there because not all the dispensaries are doing it by the numbers. Right. They're not having their stuff inspected properly. They're not using organics or you know, they're using pesticides that they shouldn't be. They're using products that stay on the plants that can't be taken off. Um, yet they're getting through to the public um, because it's such a massive market. And we have, you know, we have a bureau, we have a cannabis control group now that was formed up to regulate in California and oversee all of this. And then we have regulatory agencies like us, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Cannabis Enforcement Program. But we can't possibly inspect all of these places. No. I mean, it is, it is a, you know, it's like a needle in a haystack, no pun intended. It's that overwhelming. So all this stuff is not getting inspected. And when you have, when you can cut a corner for a profit, it's going to happen, right. you know, and it does. Sadly, it does. But I mean, even, extent, even on Ozark, I mean, like that's, a, that's another, another, um, you know, uh, plot line out of Ozark that they're doing sure this, is, yeah. this huge deal, one big deal with their illegal stuff. They're, they're giving it to, you know, a, a legitimate, Pharmaceutical company. They're making yep. one giant deal to a legitimate yeah. pharmaceutical company. So I don't know if there's, I mean, when you think about it like that, I didn't even think about that. That was the, that was the plot line. Like it's, it, why well, make 10,000 deals when you can make one to this, this one person, this one pharmaceutical company. And then once they have it, well, now it's totally yeah. legit and, and it goes in, but nobody's thinking about what's on the, you know, how that was grown or, or any of that stuff. Uh, well, that's the crazy part about it. I think uh, that Ozark plot, while it's fictional, it it's not far from, you know, a plausible. It right. really isn't. When you look at the fact that money drives the bus on so many of these deals and money has been driving the bus on black market cannabis with the, what they call the smuggler days. And I have a lot of cannabis farmers that were illegal you know, they weren't dirty farmers. They were very organic and prided on or, or you know, organics, nothing impure, uh, protecting their waterways. They're really environmentally conscious, but they were just illegal in the black market, staying off the grid. What they consider themselves as farmers, not cultivators, mm -hmm. not product farmers. And they're looking at it this way. They're like, yeah, you know, uh, the legitimate industry and the greed uh, and the cutting corners and the shady deals and the lack of concern for actual quality of product, we see it all the time and it absolutely demoralizes us. And they're actually, these type of growers on the illegal side are pushing us out of even being regulated because of all the red tape and all the hoops and all the yeah. money we're gonna pay or try to pay to do it by the numbers when we're already putting a pure product out there. And again, it comes back to politics and greed yeah. and the dollar. Yeah. You know, we get we get it involved and it just, it's, it's gonna wreck the system. And that's what we gotta get past with some better you know, national front. There was another uh, documentary that I saw, and it was the first time that I became aware of like what was going on. And then I saw you on Joe Rogan, which was also very interesting. I'd love to talk to you about what your experience was on Joe Rogan. That had to be sure. an amazing experience as well. But I think this documentary was called Murder Mountain on, yeah. on Netflix. Yep. Is that what it was called? It was, um, yeah. And I watched it and just, it there was a, there were a couple of scenes that were, almost exactly what you just outlined that these people, they wanted to, they were like, okay, cool. Like do it regularly, get a license and I won't get hassled and I can do it exactly the way that I want to. And then it became such, it became almost impossible for these people to do it legally, right. even though they wanted to, and they were trying to, to play by the rules, but it became so expensive and it became, you know, so they were, it, it was just way more difficult to do it the way, and it didn't seem like it needed to be in this, in this documentary. It's been a while since I, since I saw that it was well done and, um, and, and cool. That was, it, that was Humboldt County, right? Is that, that was, that? yeah, that was way up in Humboldt, way up in the front end, the top end of the Emerald Triangle. And, and that was a really good documentary. I like how they approached that. In fact, a lot of our footage of our team ended up in that documentary, much yeah. to our surprise. Yeah, I was thinking because yeah. there were there were like you know, look like look like a SEAL team coming in there to to you know bust this thing up. That was you guys, right? 
it, it was us. And I didn't know we were in it because it had been stock footage taken from. And so I'm getting calls from all these people, Are you watching this documentary yet. And Tom, I, I had it on the to watch list. Right. But I mean, we were running hot. I was still operational. You know, I wasn't watching a lot of TV then. And I started watching. I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, that that's us from that mission. And all right, OK, yeah, that, that's cool. Oh, they got the dog, too. But no, to your point. That was a great documentary, and it, it absolutely highlighted what the legitimate farmer or the ex-trespass outlaw farmer, not trespass, but outlaw farmer, private land, wants to try to become. And in our documentary, the interviews we did with completely legitimate growers now that have multi-million dollar farms that are going under because of the black market and really good organic, environmentally conscious farmers that have been trying to get legal for five years but still can't you know, get through every hoop the county and the state is requiring, um, mind blowing their stories mm. and mind blowing their perceptions five years deep. And we're going to have those in the call sign trailblazer documentary coming up, but it was actually just the same message or very similar to what we both saw in murder mountain, but now it's gone to other counties and just got so much wider because we're down the road a lot further now, wow. you know? So something does have to change. And wow. it's nice that I appreciate having the conversation about it. Cause so many people don't realize that it's not just, well, Hey man, just legalize it. And it's all going to go away. Oh yeah. I mean, that's, that's true. And especially when you come from, from a perspective like you and I, and this audience of, of a conservation perspective of, well, think whatever you want to about drugs, but you could think whatever you want to about logging a national forest. And I don't think that anybody would be, would be uh, in favor of clear cutting a national right. forest around sensitive trout or salmon streams. Not, Never. not that are listening right. to this, this thing or putting a, yeah. you know, the pebble mine in like, yeah. why, why would you do that? Like, uh, I don't yeah. care how much money is going to be generated from that. There's got to be a better way because it's going to destroy this whole area or an oil spill or, or any of any of those things. No one that's Absolutely. listening to this podcast wants to hear about those those man-made disasters that impact um you know our our world and the way that we like to to live in it but and that's that's just a different way of thinking about this is like well legalize it okay but here are just like with anything right like it's gonna you're, there's rarely going to be just a straight up very simple answer to to a, a problem and when you have you know like cannabis is probably as popular as it's ever been. Maybe oh, yeah. I, mean, I would think maybe even more popular than the sixties. Right. So yeah, there's agree. a giant appetite for it. Legalize it. Okay. Well, when you watch that murder mountain, they show lots of things that you may not have thought about like, okay, legalize it. But now you're pitting these little farmers up against multimillion dollar, um, pharmaceutical companies that they can't compete. And so now they have to go back to the black market, even though they don't want to. Right. And, and that, I don't know, it's just a lot of different things. And, and just like with any, any issue, I think it's interesting to talk about it and learn both sides or all sides before you really have a, have a strong opinion one way or another, whether, whether it's good to legalize it or whether it's good not to legalize it or I don't know. I mean, these are things that I didn't have any idea about until I watched that Murder Mountain and then reading your book and, and listening to what you have to say. There's just a lot of different kind of things to, to consider. And especially when you're, when you're a hunter or fisherman, it's a different deal. Yeah. For, I think for us, especially because we're so passionate about that, you know, and, and most Americans, whether they hunt or fish or not, once they get in the outdoors and if you, if, if you tell, you know, say an urban based mother and son or mother and daughter that are hiking a public trail on the edge of a Creek, but they've never fished. They never hunted. They've never, you know, been out overnight. And you say, you know what? Those trout are cool, huh? And rainbows are running. Maybe they're planters. Maybe they're not. Hey, look at that black tailed deer with their little fun. What if they were all gone tomorrow? Oh, that'd be horrible. I mean, your, your, your daughter would never know what that looks like or never have that experience. And when you put it in perspective of that, not being an exaggeration, literally from what one grow site next to that one Creek where they're standing now for their hike, it opens a lot of eyes. Like, well, I had no idea. I would definitely have paid more attention to prop 64 and I would not have sanctioned a law that lessens a penalty 
for a foreign invader that's a deportable felon on an international watch list in America doing this crime for hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars for their enterprise and walking away going, I win, you know, it's just the depth of it. And, you know, and, and the demographic has changed. I think you're hundred percent correct when you say cannabis has never been more popular than now. I think the last, and I, I know this is outdated, but like 50 plus million Americans consume cannabis on a regular basis on some level, whether it's recreational, medicinal, CBD, anti-inflammatory, whatever. Um, you, you know, so there's the demand for one, but something else going on in this isn't only the environmental crime. What we saw in Siskiyou with those other criminal elements, those other transnational uh, criminal organization cartels was animal abuse, <laughs> bringing dogs into these grow sites as protection dogs and then leaving them when they leave the grow mm. to starve or the dogs aren't working out. So they're putting barbed wire around their snouts. They're emaciated. They're cut up on their bodies. Mm. I mean, we saw some heinous stuff, Tom, that we did not anticipate when I was up following that second documentary and helping out with it. Stories we need to tell human trafficking to bring people within the organization that have been trafficked, forced labor into these cannabis farms for American black market cannabis everywhere. That's going on both on the Mexican side, as well as those other groups I mentioned earlier. So there's a lot of, you know, really ugly anti, you know, just lack of humanity crimes going on outside of just an illegal drug trade mm. um, related to this black market. And that's why we're getting sadly the people that are doing it by the numbers that have an ethic, they have a conscience, they're environmentally conscious. They just like cannabis. So they want to grow the best cannabis. Like we want to do the best job we can on our outreach efforts. They have pride in it. They're concerned with health and there are that percentage, but sadly they're the minority. And uh, um, you taking the time to talk about it with me today, I'm very grateful for because your listeners are maybe going to gain something from it that haven't been aware Um it blows people's minds daily as I continue to talk about it. It's not going away. So we're just going to stay in the fight and try to keep educating. Yeah. What about the documentary that you've referred to a couple of times? What, tell me about that and where it's going to be and how people can watch it. Yeah, we're going to, um, we're in, we're done with all of our interviews. We have a reenactment and some tactical shooting to do here. It's called call sign trailblazer. It's going to hit the film festival circuit early next year. And I can't say who is looking at it from the standpoint of the streaming networks, but we have three major players that are all want it. Um, and it's going to end up dropping after the film festival run on one of those streamers that I'll be able to mention then it's called call sign trailblazer. It's a great group of conservation military veteran producers that all reached out together, um, to kind of tell the story, the, the personal and professional backstory, but more importantly, the issues of what Mets fighting and how much deeper this goes into the nation. Um, but we're going to use a lot of California examples given my history there. And we did a lot of initial interviews and field stuff up here in Montana in February in the dead of winter to look at some of this pristine water and pristine wilderness area that hasn't been impacted by some of these groups and why we still got to protect those places in America. And at the same time, restore the places that you and I frequent all the time for our fishing endeavors and everything else and make sure they stay protected. Hmm. So um, I'll keep everybody posting on that, but look for something early next year and we'll be rocking and rolling with that. Yeah. You working on anything else? Like, not like you, I mean, you're a pretty busy guy. What else you got going on? You got another book going on or anything like that? We, uh, you know, it, something just dropped on that. We have to go into an additional printing of Hidden War. We're down oh. to a handful of copies of the book you've got. Right so on. we're going to do, we're going to do uh, another printing's about to drop. Um, I've got a, di a different forward, a different afterward coming from some uh, like-minded special operations conservationists that are going to participate. We're going to have Jack Carr right in the forward and my friend, Mike Ritland, the canine guru. I was yeah. on Mike Drop podcast with him. He's going to write the afterword. I'm going to freshen up the introduction because I've got to modernize all a lot of the stuff we're talking about today um, and go from there. And then and then you'll have a, a new version of Hidden War, a new cover design, the whole nine, because it's not just cannabis now. It, it's evolved. So uh, we're getting on to the next stage of that. And I'm excited about it. I'm going to have to start writing here pretty quick and, and get going. Yeah. And then you got uh, your podcast with Wayne. Uh, with Wayne Saunders, Warden's Watch, and Thin Green Line, right? Yep, we got those two, and we just had you on for one of our one of our best Thin Green Line episodes recently. That yeah, just dropped, and thank, thanks again for coming on to our show. Man, it was uh, great. Yeah, Warden's Watch and and Thin Green Line are going hot and heavy, and uh, 
Wayne and I are both going to be at the NOWEA conference in Nashville the second week of July, which is basically the national uh, game wardens convention for Canadian and American game wardens nationwide. We'll have a, we'll have our mobile podcast booth there. I'm also going to be, um, I'm doing a presentation speak to the group, uh, doing a book signing and, and doing blade sales as well for the thin green line trailblazer blade and, and the book combination. And just, uh, being with game wardens for the first time in a conference that hasn't happened for three years because of COVID. So we're yeah. pretty excited and it, and it's in Nashville, not far from your neck of the woods. So we're excited to go there. It's going to yeah, be fun. That'll be great. Well, I've got, you also sent me when you sent me the, uh, the book you sent me this knife, which is amazing. I've been messing with it the whole the whole podcast, but it's V knife. <laughs> I keep hearing that right? click. And yeah, <laughs> I know. But tell me about this thing because this is this is a really really nice knife. When I when I got it, it came in this in this box, which was super cool, and I didn't have any idea what it was, and so I opened it up, and then it was this beautiful knife. Which you know, I'm a fan of pocket knives, but this this one in particular, I like I like the quick open. You got a glass breaker. You've got this, um, I guess you're saying that's a seatbelt seat belt deal. Yep. Seat belt webbing, you know, for, for guys doing any type of tactical work, harnesses for helicopters, you name it. But yeah, um, this is kind of a dream come true. This is, uh, the V knives, the signature trailblazer, thin green line trailblazer or folding version. And basically I merged up with Mike Bellacamp, who was one of the guys that started running the spider co factory way back in the early nineties oh, and heck of a, a blade knife. maker. Fellow conservationist, good friend, um, brought me on as brand ambassador for all of the knives, but really wanted to collaborate to build the knife. I wish I could have had all 30 years that I was running operations. Um, and we wanted to have a glass breaker, like you saw a small carbide, which works mm -hmm. great. We got a whole commercial we filmed on it up on my YouTube page. The glass cutter uh, or the seatbelt cutter has a replaceable razor blade. So you're not impacting, you know, your really good drop point of your D2 steel hardened edge. Um, I designed this for guys like us, Tom, uh, whether you're a game warden, a fisherman, a hunter, a survivalist, got to have a drop point for skin and fish or gut and animals. Um, we have partially serrated and non serrated versions. I sent you the thin green line serrated version because yeah. you cut rope, mm -hmm. you know, obviously on the <laughs> angling side and boating and I do too. So, uh, but we also have the non serrated versions for just straight skinning. And this is the OD green handled one. That's yeah. uh, very similar. So we have four different versions of this knife. And uh, yeah, they become our best seller, and I uh, I'm really proud of it. People seem to really be liking it. Well, out of the box, it'll shave you. I can tell you that right now. Yeah, one thing Mike Bellacamp's known for is one of the best edges in the industry. Man, he uh, Look at we that. have a proprietary 17 degree edge uh, that we shaved a little spot on my arm right there, <laughs> <laughs> and that is I haven't sharpened it. It's that's straight out of the box. Um, yeah, that's nice. Well, this will definitely be going uh, elk hunting with me. Uh, this fall and uh, nice, I'll be starting man. to carry it and I'll be starting to carry it all the time, but I appreciate well, I that. I'm honored man. brother. And I hope to, uh, hope to see some pictures with you getting a big old elk with that sucker. Man, me about. too. I am, I am madly practicing with my bow and uh, <laughs> Here you know, I just, I, I, I love, I love that about, about the elk hunting and the, um, and especially the archery is I'm, I'm a, I'm a real beginner. My son is, my son is all into it. He is, really into it and and he's very good um he shoots in the archery league in bozeman and he's 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 very good so i have my own personal coach but i like the process of this whole thing this all reminds me so much of like my early time in key west and then the permit fishing and the preparation and the practice yeah. and the casting and the more casting and the the tinkering at home with the flies and 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 it's all the same there's all the same uh things going on with the air weight and the 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 draw uh poundage of the draw and the bow that you choose and then practicing at all these different different um you know distances so that you can just be prepared for anything. And then, yeah. you know, knowing that when you see that thing, your heart rate's going to be up. So, you know, do a whole bunch of burpees and then, and then get up and try to shoot <laughs> under, you know, while your heart rate's up, that's because that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, and it's the same thing that used to happen with the permit, the permit you show up, my heart rate would go jack, jacked up through the roof. My knees are shaking. And it's like, I could make this cast. No problem but not when they're all tailing in front of you, you know, it's a whole different yeah. deal. And I just love the, the, uh, just, just the whole process of, of getting ready. I don't know if I'm going to be ready when, when it comes, you know, 
to it. I hope so, but I will, I will have at least put in the time if I can make the shot at the, uh, hopefully I get a shot, right? Like the, <laughs> that's, that's plenty of, there's, there's plenty of, of elk hunting situations where it almost happens or you get close, but you don't actually get the shot. And that's been our, our, uh, experience more. Well, we've only yeah. had the one where we've, well, when I've been with my son, we've only killed the one he's killed other ones, but, um, it's a great animal and a great pursuit. And just, it's just one of the, one of the great outdoor pursuits that I've, encountered so i'm super looking forward to it but i'll take this knife with me i'll take it so john well, i'm honored man and um that i just gotta say i'm super excited for you because you get to share it with your son yes and archery like anything we do there is so much to the process and that's what makes it so much more rewarding right brother is you put all that time in and even if you don't get a shot but you see some elk still going to be great and when you do get that shot, it's magical. But man, I'm excited. I can't wait to hear how it goes. And sharing it with your son is going to make it magic, man. That's yeah. great. I'll send you a video. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know if we were following one another when when it happened earlier, but I was with my son when he killed his when he killed his first one this fall. And it was it was unbelievable. He he, he had spent five years with this process that we just talked yeah. about. And, what a, and it what was a DIY dream, hunt, you know, and he, yeah. he had forecasted, I think they're going to be here and we go there and, you know, it just all materialized and it, and it just worked out. And he was just so, so excited. I'll, I'll send you that video. Uh, Please do. After Kudos this. to him. But, uh, That's special. That's special. Yeah. Well, listen, thanks so much for coming on. And I would highly suggest this book, Hidden War. Um, and uh, it's a great, fantastic book. John Norris, he's uh, he's a great guest. You can also check him out on Joe Rogan. He was on that. What do you know? What episode that was on Joe Rogan? Yeah, that was episode thirteen forty on wow. Joe Rogan. And and guys, if you mentioned the book and the blade, if anybody wants personalized copies of the book or personalized blade packs, Tom, they can just reach out to me on Instagram, and it's okay. just at John Norris, J O H N N O R E S. And my website is johnnorris.com. And you can get right to my email if you want. And if you have any conservation questions, you know, I get a lot of people wanting to be game wardens or asking questions on cannabis, whatever. I, I answer them daily all the time. So reach out anytime and uh, really appreciate being on, man. Yeah, it's good to we'll see do you. It and, and we'll do it again. We'll do it again. I enjoyed yeah. having you. And I enjoyed yeah. being on your show, too. You can check that out if you hadn't heard that. All right, John, that's it for today. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. And um, that's it. Another great guest next week. See you.